Good evening and welcome to this first ever online event for the Friends of Kettle's Yard, which each year provides vital funds towards the running of Kettle's Yard's house and gallery in Cambridge and needs our support more than ever at this time. My name is Sally Knowles and I'm on the events committee for the Friends of Kettle's Yard, as is my colleague Sophia Victoria and also tonight we have a friend, uh, Rachel Montgomery Holdsworth. Becoming a friend is not only a great way of providing support to Kettle's Yard, but also a way of developing your own interest in art. We organise a variety of activities, including most recently before lockdown, a visit to Christie's Auction House, to the artist Rebecca Salter's studio at the Royal Academy, to Anthony Gormley's studio in King's Cross, as well as some art trips abroad to New England, Amsterdam and Bilbao. If you're new to the Friends and interested in learning more about possibly becoming a friend yourself, uh, please do take the opportunity to let us know and we will follow it up with you. We will also provide a link in the chat box below to, to more information. I had been in initial discussions at the beginning of the year with Kate to arrange a visit for the friends to her studio in London. As I understand it, I've never been, her studio is rather compact and it would only have been possible for a small group to visit. So I decided to approach Kate and ask if she might give us a virtual tour of her studio. So when Kate offered to show us online around her studio at her home in Kent and to talk about her work and to be interviewed by her friend, the, car the caricaturist and potter Roger Law, I jumped at the opportunity. We're going to have a short viewing of Kate's studio in Kent, followed by a fireside chat, obviously without the fire, with Roger, and then we'll open the floor to questions and answers. So without further ado, I would like to introduce you to Kate Malone and Roger Law, who have kindly given up their time to be with us this evening. As many of you will know, Kate is one of Britain's leading ceramic artists and a previous judge on the Great Pottery Throwdown. Kate's work is held in numerous public collections, including the V&A, the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford, Bristol City Museum and the LA County Museum of Art. She was appointed an MBE in 2019 for services to ceramic art. Roger Law is well known as the creative energy behind the satirical political puppet show Spitting Image and for his caricatures for publications such as The Observer, Sunday Times and The New York Times. But he's also a maker of finely crafted ceramics. He has spent much time in China making large porcelain vessels and he's lectured at the RCA, the Central School of Art and Hornsey College of Art. Roger also knows Cambridge very well because he grew up here and he attended the Cambridge School of Art. So before we start the studio tour, I'd like to invite Kate and Roger to briefly introduce themselves. So Kate, over to you first. Hello. <laughs> Hello, this is my cat. He's, he's wanting his supper. He just came in. Um, and as Sally so, actually I'd like to offer you a job, Sally. You, in, you introduced <laughs> us so well. But um, essentially, I'm in my studio in Kent, and uh, Sally mentioned I, had, I have a studio in London, amazing little studio on a muse in Hackney, on the borders of Hackney and Islington that my husband built, and for 30 years, I was in a space five metres by five metres, and a kiln room the same size. And people used to come to my studio and say, where's your main studio? <laughs> I used to say, this is it. So for 30 years I had everything on trolleys and wheels and in crates and up in the ceiling and down under the ground. But actually three years ago, and I'm going to unclip my camera from this stand, three years ago we sold the house that my husband built in London. We've kept one of them because he built two houses on empty plots of land and we bought a beautiful home in Kent. So I'm going to switch this round if I can. So here we are. Uh, so that's the thatched barn, and there's the barn where I store all my moulds and prepare all my clay. And here we are, this is two carports, two open-fronted carports when we bought the house. And a fantastic company, I did the drawing on the back of an envelope, matching the windows that are on the house, which is a sort of funny rambling house, arts and crafts house, where the cat still wants his dinner. And um, I sort of match the window pattern, and had the kiln put in before the doors went on. And I have this, which I'm so lucky to have, this amazing kiln. Uh, it measures the inside chamber is three foot by three foot by four foot. It's electric. Has made it, we had to have three phase dug across the courtyard and across the road to get it here. 
And this was built by a man who's just about to retire. And 33 years ago, he built me an identical kiln, a bit with a bit less technology in London. And that was my kiln that filled the whole kiln room in London. So this kiln, which is a trolley kiln, it has a track here. And there's a piece in it which nobody's really meant to be seeing because my art dealer, Adrian Sassoon, shows all the new finished work. I hope he's not watching. Are you watching, Adrian? I'm in trouble if I am. But anyway, here we are. And so this is the, the trolley kiln that comes out. All the kiln furniture is just here on trolleys and the kiln shelves. These are very precious kiln shelves, some of them huge. And now here, I asked for the kiln to look as sexy as possible. Here it is. This is the stainless steel door reflecting everything. Cat's still here. And this is a trolley of ware that's drying. I'm making some bookends. These are the trays that all the pots are fired on here. Every tray has a sort of catcher of blaze. Here are some pieces drying, sitting, waiting for their biscuit firing. And there are the lids for them. I think there's some more. Oh, there's a new piece under there. And this is my glaze section so every single glaze recipe well every single glaze has a recipe and my speciality is crystalline glazes so you see these these sort of bubbles here these are crystals that grow in the cooling cycle of the kiln it's something that i read about in emmanuel cooper great glaze uh, expert and potter and i read about it in his in his book of glazes and I started testing them and I went to visit Derek Clarkson who is sadly de deceased now but he taught me all his tricks so this one has a reference EPR DCE 138 and this bucket was mixed on the 13th of the 11th 19 and you can see some of them were mixed in 18 some of them in 17 and so this every single bucket has fresh glazing that basically keeps really well and they're all mixed up on these weighing scales with all these raw ingredients that are in here to 0.2 of a gram. And uh, it's just a delight. So this is really my palette. And actually on the shelves, there's a whole load of sort of whites and then there's browns up above and then going through to honeys, going through to sort of greens and then blues and then more greens and sort of special effects. And uh, these are glazes that were mixed this week with reference to some new work. So that's the sort of glaze area. And the glazing is the piece, the, the bit that I like the least really. I find it very difficult. There's so much more jeopardy with glazes because you can ruin something. Actually, a, a bad glaze can ruin a fabulous pot. And a good glaze can make a normal pot fabulous. So it's always kind of more risky. But, and this is into the sort of making room, it seems to have happened that, that way. This is the first time I've had natural light in my studio because my first studio in 86 was in a railway tunnel with so much noise you couldn't even speak on the phone even though there weren't really many phones around at that time. And then I had a studio in a cave in Provence and then the studio that my husband built me in London was between two factories and also that was quite dark. So this is the first time I've had natural light which is a joy. There's another piece that I'm not meant to be showing you. And um, this is my little shelves of inspiration that go from 17th century Chinese little idols for sort of praying and sending good fruits and, and wishing for a good harvest through to a little Alsace. Oh, I seem to have gone blank. Have you still got me? Here we are. I think you've still got me. An Alsace tobacco jar. There's another Alsace tobacco jar. There's a Dalton mint and piece, little French pieces, another little tiny Dalton teapot. So I'm very inspired by these sprigs. And then sort of fossils. And there's a Banksia seed pod. And there's a gagot somewhere. Where's my gagot? Oh, there's my gagot. That's a really old piece. And that is a whale's ear bone in the middle. So all those things and a big seed pod from Sri Lanka. All these things sort of feed into what I do, normal thing. And this is the piece that I made during lockdown. And it's obviously a tree. I, didn't, I started making it without knowing at all what it was going to be like. And uh, it sort of grew. And um, it's sort of like I was in South Africa and I saw a Banksia tree. I got a book called Audrey Hepburn in Hats 
from the local charity shop. I've been looking at a lot of these lovely pictures of her in beautiful hats. I have a great friend who's a hat maker. This is a little piece also made during lockdown, which is an opening lidded box. And then pieces drying, pieces bisque fired. And these are all lockdown pieces, really. So you might be wondering, I do work about 15 hour day, but I also have an amazing team of helpers who I've worked with for up to 10 years. And normally we work together. They all work for me, um, about eight of them, uh, two days a week. And in lockdown, um, they all took molds and bits of clay to their own studios and they've been working remotely. So for instance, these seeds here, which is, this is a pokori with a lid. I won't lift it because it's only this fired, it's not finished. And uh, these individual pumpkins were made in molds that they took home. And so each one of these little pine cones or pumpkins probably took an hour or two to make. And I have a courier who's been going during lockdown, doing a round of their studios all in London. And I get these boxes, sealed boxes that you get on the internet. And they're all full of things that I then join together. And in fact, it has got very difficult because they all need work. Most of them have slipped through the net of government assistance because they're self-employed and their profits weren't high. They're trying to make, uh, my objective is that they all leave me and become well-known potters themselves. But for instance, these little seeds in the middle of here, they were made by Erica and they took her about 10 days to make them all. And they all came in a little Tupperware box. And then Josh made these bits somewhere else in near Farnham. And amazingly, we've managed to keep them all damp enough to carry on working with them, or I have managed to. Um, and uh, so it's been quite a trial. There's a mirror at the end of the studio so I can see what I'm making. It's been quite difficult, but at the same time, very productive. And I feel very grateful that this is a sanctuary, really. This is a piece that I'm making. Uh, the, the studio is a sanctuary and work is. I mean, I'm a workaholic. I know Rogers and I'm a bit embarrassed that I'm talking about myself because Roger is my hero. <laughs> and here I am talking about myself. So I'm just going to finish the little studio tour and I'm going to clip the telephone into a tripod. But before I do that, I'm going to show you my glaze recipe book. So this hasn't been published. It's only about, uh, there's four of them, uh, different editions that have happened as we've modified them with glazes. This is the glaze archive that's in the London studio in Dalston, Hackney. Um, and that's permanently there with all the tests. This is the sort of secondary thing. And all, this is a great big tome that we had bound on the internet. And all these colours here are different base glaze recipes. So every single glaze, as I've mentioned, has a recipe. And there are the recipes with frit and zinc and flint and bentonite and manganese and copper and all these different recipes. So this is 30 years of work, which took me two years to pull together with a photographer and a professional archivist, because all these notes weren't as neat as this to begin with, they were in chaos. But actually we pulled it all together and proofread it. And so this is really my sort of telephone directory. We call it the Glaze Bible in the studio. And uh, hopefully, eventually it'll get published my art dealer agent as soon as has said he doesn't think we should publish it till I'm a bit older. <laughs> and I'm 61. So there you go. Hoping to pot until I drop. And there's a pumpkin being made in a two piece mold. There's the mold, half of the mold. The other half is over there. And there's the finished article. And that's nickel that has grown these crystals. It's grown many more crystals than I thought it would. Um, I'm quite pleased with it. There you go. So um, I don't know how long I've spoken for. Yeah, probably about the right amount of time, I hope. It's my notice board with drawings of pots that I want to make or have made. Or I want, to, I want to make some garden stalls. This is another one of my heroes, Sandra Rhodes, who's a dear friend. And uh, yeah, that's it really. Okay, is that's that wonderful. Yes, that's really good. <laughs> Um, do you want to come and sit down and maybe Roger you introduce yourself before while Kate gets herself sorted? Sure. Well, I'm very impressed. <laughs> I'm exhausted at looking at all that work. Um, I, for those of you that are in Cambridge, um, I lived there for quite a long time. And the studio where I made 
the caricatures for Spitting Image was also in Victoria Street. And I had a little house in Orchard Street. The people that live there will know this enormous wisteria that's grown all over. It's very beautiful. And I, when I sold it, that was the one thing that I missed. But when we worked there, we made the Thatcher teapot and the Ronald Reagan coffee pot and the Marx Brothers salt, pepper and mustard. And they were made in Stoke and they were made in a little factory with a couple of um, Stokies <coughs> called Moreland Pottery. Yeah. And whilst I was there, I saw these. Kate. Let me see. Oh, Roger, you've got one of those. I've got not only that, I've got the milk jug that goes with it. I haven't and even got that. I haven't they're got really, it. Look, they're really jolly. I use it all the time. Oh. I really oh. like them. Anyway, I'm, I, um, I met Kate really. I, um, I got interested in pottery, pottery around the wrong way. I didn't study it at school because it was all brown and boring. Um, and I came to it much later. And I met Kate in London where she had an amazing, complicated uh, fish. I don't know what it was, but I was fascinated with the modeling and the glazing. And I didn't forget that. So there you go. That's how we met. That's another. Kate Mathieu, Good Lord. Well done. a long way. <laughs> so, fitting image was really exhausting and making things that were not ugly mugs, uh, trying to make ceramics was a, a way of sin. So when it all ended, I went to, to uh, China and had a lot of fun making pots. And that's about it, really. It's sad to say I've gone back to type and I'm doing another spitting image. But, you know, they crossed my palm with silver, so what could I do? <laughs> and the time's right, I think. I, mean, I remember when you had this place down on the East End near my London studio, and I was just totally in awe of the audacity and the, uh, and the bravery of spitting image, really, the political thing. So I'm so excited. This is in the autumn, it's coming back to our screens, yes, it isn't is. it? What channel? It's very strange what's happened because with this technology, the world's gone global. Last time we made spitting image for England. And then if they wanted a spitting image, we used to have to go to Istanbul or Turkey or Rome in some horrible studio and set it all up. Now this time uh, they've sold it all around the world. And the characters, yes, there are Amer lots of Americans, obviously Trump lots of the English, but we've also got Australians. And uh, Jacinda, the lady that runs New Zealand, seems to have been turned into Mary Poppins, because she's the only world leader that's kind of okay. Well, we'll see. Maybe it will, maybe it won't. I mean, I remember somebody dribbling and, you know, sort of followed, I found it so strong, it frightened me. You know, it was really, really, really moving, you know. I think I actually turned it off once. <laughs> well, I kid used to hide behind the couch, but um, they remembered it. That's and I've thought. got... I always, I always thought with that that it would be... It would either die the death or be successful. I, I, it wasn't like something warm that flowed over you. Well, but don't you think, Kate, don't you think... I mean... We didn't earn very much money at all, and it was quite difficult with kids and everything else. Doing what you want mm. keeps you poor, but television made a great deal of difference. Did you find that with the Pottery Throwdown? Um, yeah, what, you mean yeah, financially yeah, or a different? Sure. No, no, it was BBC, so we got paid £175 a day. Ah. <laughs> what about the spin-offs, though? I mean, people... No, not really. No, I mean, the great spin-off was that, uh, well, the reason I did the throwdown was because it was a chance to get ceramics into, and in fact, it got into three and a half million English, you know, UK uh, living rooms. And it was about kids. And it was about showing, to me, it was about families and kids and showing them possibilities of pottery. 
And in fact, Keith and I nearly, you know, had nervous breakdowns because the whole crew didn't really know anything about ceramics. So we were on it the whole time. It looked like we were very glamorous judges. I had rather a lot of makeup. I felt I looked a bit like Dame Edna Everidge. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> but um, essentially, we were exhausted, you know, and we lost money to do it. So, but the thing to me is that it profited the whole field. I mean, the people at Ceramic Art London, all the makers that they were selling more, there was more understanding about the complications and the jeopardy of pottery and the joy. And then all these centers that are opening. I mean, many, many cities and towns now have these community workshops. And the whole, I mean, the whole sanctuary, pottery to me is a sanctuary and it's a, it's a great place of meditation and centering. And so many more people are now enjoying that. And I know I think, um, lockdown, I think the lockdown made a lot of difference to people. You, I mean, I don't, I've been locked up for God knows months at a time. Thank God I've got lots of work to do. Yeah. But people are making things. Didn't you find with television that none of the people that work in television know how anything's made? And a lot of young people don't. No, they so, don't. No. I mean, it's very, it makes it very difficult because and possibly for the, the, the pottery throwdown, because they think, um, well, we'll just move this script up to the first show. <laughs> and it's got, you know, the coronavirus isn't finished, and won't be finished for two weeks. <laughs> and it's got the coronavirus and Donald Trump trying to do a deal with it. And it's funny, and you would like to give it to them, but it's, it can't, you can't do the show right here. It's not like dealing with six, six actors. Yeah. And that's very frustrating. And it's much, much worse than it was 25 years ago or 30 oh. years ago when I started it. People really don't know how things are made. Well, I mean, I mean I, I'm 60 when you're a little bit older, aren't you? But I mean, did you do pottery, woodwork, metalwork, sewing, cooking at school? Well, did. you did have, they, you learned different skills. I was mainly interested in drawing and had some good drawing teachers. I wasn't, I, I loved clay, but I didn't like what you had to do with it. You know, you had to make these pots that, you know, I didn't show any interest in. But then you were taught calligraphy, you were taught how to paint, how to put watercolor down. All of these things have kept me in work for, I went at 14, I've been working ever since. I, think I, it... I worked at the art, I worked for money at the art school because you quickly picked up skills. And now, what are we doing for our children now? What are we doing for our secondary schools? I mean, that's what was good about the throwdown and the sewing bee and even the bake-off, you know, um, in that people were shown how things are done. But it's all about material knowledge, isn't it? I mean, it's all about understanding how different materials behave. And once you do that, like you said, you've got skills that you can apply you know, I'm, I know you're a bit of a maverick, and I think I probably am in my way. And um, we just applied those skills that we learned, you know, and it gives a child confidence. You know, I'm working with a charity, all, 25 of England's potters, including you, Rog, have given a pot that's made of three kilos of clay, and we're going to auction it in November. And we're raising funds to put pottery wheels and kilns into after school clubs for kids. In yeah. the, children in the most impoverished and vulnerable kids in our society, you know, around the country, we're having the auction in November, because they have to have a go. You, know, you don't know if you're good at it unless you have a go, do you? No, no, you don't. But they find ways around it. I'm always astonished with the new technology, you get kids that are really talented, that haven't been taught skills, and they do some amazing things with the technology. What's are a bit weird for an old man is um and you must have experienced this they show you something young people show you something they want to make and they think is we'll make this and you say have you got any idea how long it took this person to learn how to make this i mean you shouldn't really say things like that but they assume if it's on the net it's doable and yeah. it isn't you know mm. Because the best of it is, uh, is crafted over a number of years and then suddenly it, it flowers or it doesn't, which is a bit disappointing. But your modelling and your drawing skills translated from spitting image 
what, with the puppet and the caricatures and everything. Onto, I was looking at your pots in the Ceramic Review, there's an article, isn't there? And I saw them at Collect, the giant ones. And, and we differ in that I tend to add on to pots and you tend to sort of take away that you've, you've found that way of doing it. But the, the, you drawing on those surfaces in China and anybody can see, you know, if they look on your website or on the internet, they can see it. It's just absolutely alive. And you, you, you weren't a potter then. Well, you know, this is why making things is where you learn, because the reason that I didn't add things on the pots like you do, it's porcelain, it's not stoneware. Unless right. you put it on the lid, right on the top, yeah. it drops off in the kiln. Yeah. And, um, you know, I'm pretty stupid. I kept making them and everything kept dropping off. <laughs> but the great thing about Xing De Zhen, it's like spitting image. It, there are workshops with people in them. And many people in the workshops are hugely skilled. The only problem I found there was the language problem. And you, you say, look, look, that's the fourth pot that's blown up. You know, what are we gonna do? And they say, well, it won't work. <laughs> well, I, well, why didn't you tell me? <laughs> oh, it was, I thought that's what you wanted. And you've got this problem. And eventually those big pieces used to um, blow out or bend in. And the guy that ran the factory said to me about nine years into going to China every year, said, if you want to do that, why don't you make the pots thicker? And then it'll be fine. Oh, well, how, how deep can I go then? He said, well, you can go in about what you'd call half an inch if you want, which is what I wanted nine years previously <laughs> but none of it would have would have happened without um a work workshop i've never done anything without other people yeah which is a way that we sort of have a parallel i mean all the pots here if i hadn't got my team and some of them are better than me at certain things definitely erica who's from hungary who learned how to do bone china painting in in helen pottery uh, painting flowers and things. Her fine hand is finer. And so I have no problem in trying to encourage her into finer and finer things. And Enrique from Spain, who, who is really sharp and he's really capable of real challenges, you know. So in a way we sort of bolster, I mean, the great thing was we can communicate with each other, although it still is quite difficult sometimes, especially with this remoteness. But it's just about um, enjoying having more hands. My team I've worked with for eight years, nine, ten years. And so now in this time, I'm able to talk to Erica really specifically. And we have a language, a making language that we share, which has developed over time. Um, but I can't imagine being in China and making something for years and years and then them telling you. you know, it's hysterical. Well, it? it didn't matter really, because basically I was having fun. Yeah. And it fun. And then it finally you realize you could achieve a, a little something, which happened to A little you. something, my God. Yeah. Well, the pots are a bit large. The biggest pot I ever saw in Jing De Zhen was about 22 feet high. God. And they had a teacup that I needed a stepladder to get inside. And when I looked up, you could see the teapot spout above you. <laughs> They're pretty amazing. <laughs> and everybody makes them. I mean, you're completely surrounded by it. I've never yeah, made I mean, those workshops were enormous fun. And did you say they're changing the workshops? The, the, the sort of skills are changing or? Well, no, it, what's happened, I'm mean, not going to go on, bang on too long about this, but basically what's happened, when I first went there, it was like going back to the 50s. People had a little business and they were family businesses, not big factories. And you joined in and everybody was moving forward. And some of the people are old enough to remember your dad getting a little car or a television set. It was all like that. And now um, a lot of the small, the small potteries I worked for have got huge, huger with a great amount of overhead. And I know about that because Spitting Image had all of that. So you're looking for like 350,000 quid overhead every six weeks. 
and it isn't like going to China with not owning the means of production. You've got, you've got all this responsibility. And I was going to ask you about, I mean, you've obviously handled your TV experience really well. I just ended up chasing the overhead and shouting. I was in charge of shouting for about <laughs> seven years, you know, not making, yeah. shouting. I got very I mean, good at shouting and not very good at modeling, you know. <laughs> but you haven't made that mistake, have you? Well, I don't, yeah, it's, I mean, it's all a choice, isn't it? I mean, my overheads are quite high. I have to earn £3,000 a week to keep everything going. And obviously, you know, and I'm very aware of that, you know, £600 a day, I've got, and I've got to be productive. So I, I am quite real. My mum was a second-hand car dealer, so she was very real about money. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, there's lots of stories I could tell you about that. Did, did you pick up a few tips? I certainly did. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, my price range is, is 15 pounds and the architectural job that I did was a million and a half pounds and, and it was managed, it was very hard. And the bigger the figures got, the more scary it was. And I'm quite all, I, in fact, this crisis has really taken me back to a place that I'd like to be, which is, you know, working with one or two people. Yeah, yeah. Do and, you uh, have somebody, when you did that um, architectural job, I mean, one of the things that made Spitting Image possible in the end is I found, I found an accountant that could communicate and let me know what to do. And that made it, it didn't make it fun, but it made it doable. But it, it took made ages it to find somebody. Well, you know, when certain things in life all come together right, and it's not really my doing. At the Savile Row project, where, just to explain to people, I work on studio pottery, but I also work with architects on public art for schools, hospitals, libraries, and architecture. And I hung 11 tons of tiles on number 24 Savile Row, crystalline tiles. But the architect completely held my hand the developers insisted on me showing diagrams and graphs of drawdowns of raw material. They insisted. So the process made me uh, do it, but I couldn't do it. So I had this team of people who just seemed to appear and we just about handled it. It was a bit like getting on a motorbike that's far too strong and big and heavy for you, but you've just about managed to start it up and you just go. And you must, spitting image must have been like that but there were the right people at the right time behind it. And all sorts of funny things came into play. You know, we were really pushing it on our timing because these big sites, and, you know, they're tens of thousand pounds a day if you're behind on your schedules. But there was an issue with the right to light with some neighbors and it gave us two more months that we desperately needed and things like that. So there were so many things in life that it doesn't click together and come yeah. together. But there was this- no I, no, I understand that totally because when we started the workshop in the East End with Spitting Image, many of the people that were really quite skilled in their early 30s left very quickly because we were doing uh, 60 to 80 hours weeks and they had someone they wanted to marry. They, had a, they wanted a life briefly. <laughs> That's what they wanted. And of course they left because uh, you don't have a wife or a life if you work for Spitting Image because mm -hmm. it's difficult. So I hired, one of the people I hired was straight out of school. They were all in their teens and they learned very quickly. Peter, my partner, was frightfully upset because within six months they were better than we were. <laughs> Which didn't bother me because it means <laughs> that's another job you don't have to do. But that's how it worked. And this time, it's this time, the television people are difficult because they don't understand making, but the work, the people just turn up because they want to do it. They've heard about it and they want to do it. But there's nobody of 16 and there's no, I mean, it's a bit more responsible now. They used to sleep under the benches, Kate. It was completely Dickensian. I mean, it does take, I mean, I'm, I'm, I don't know about you. I have the most patient husband in the world who's, He's like a pot widow, really. You know, I mean, I work till three in the morning and he, he has this patient. But he's quite pleased to be free of anybody bugging him. But it's, it's down to sort of uh, being completely dedicated and addictive, really. 
I mean, you selfish. decided to step it's away from selfish. it. It fits. Try selfish. My yeah. wife is quite stoical. She, she would, um, I mean, get this. We ran out of work and I, I nipped off to New York to try and get some. I did get some, but I didn't get back for a year. Amazing. But, um, she's absolutely so terrific. I hate it when they say she's a saint, though. That's what they say. Your wife's a saint. Yeah. You don't want to hear yeah. that. No, you don't want to hear that. <laughs> but I, I've got this thing that my team, what I most want, although it's rather crazy because I'll lose their talent, is for them to have learned from the studio and from working together and develop skills and then leave and do better. Better. In fact, one or two of them are doing better. One of my team was shown by my art dealer recently and he sold at a show and I didn't, you know, and I took, it did take a bit of, you know, hum, I was quite humbled by it. it was, <laughs> but I would have preferred him to have sold and not me. But surely from Spitting Image, the talent must have spread right out. I mean, you, you must have followed some of the characters who developed the skills while they were doing that. Oh, the, quite uh, a few of them have been hugely successful. Several of them became comedy directors because they directed the show and they do very well and the makers um two of the boys that started very young were nominated for an oscar we made a short film a stop motion film like wallace and gromit but not like wallace and gromit mm -hmm. and they've done frightfully well they work for tim burton when he makes movies so yeah yeah they didn't they didn't lose out by being exploited like that but i think <laughs> when you first start out, you get exploited anyway. I certainly was. Yeah. I can not understand why people paid you to do what you wanted. I know. It's, it's only by looking back. I can, I'm just about realising why they employed me. <laughs> you solved the problem for them. You know, you filled up the hole in the newspaper adequately. But can, I, can we bring this back to pots? Sure. Because um, the pots that I've seen of yours which are drawings on pots that are then carved, or they're drawings on pots, they're paintings. They're from when you went around Australia and you, st well, you, s you put life into every creature, really, don't you? I mean, that's the thing. And well, Idra and I travelled all around it, and you do too. You keep sketchbooks. I've seen them, don't you? Well, we travel every single year. India's my big place, you know, where I, I go to. I sort of wanted to talk about Kettle's Yard, really. I mean, I went there... In, and the pots there, and the paintings of pots there, of course. Um, and I just, I was looking at the catalogue of Kessel's Yard. I went there in the 80s. I haven't been for a long time. But the fact is, it's not an art gallery, is it? And it's not a museum. It's a place to be, and it's a place to think. And I can see behind you, on the screen here, this fantastic place, which is what Jimmy said was, you know, he wanted it to be a sanctuary and he wanted the pleasure that he got from the art, other people to have it. He opened his house, didn't he? From two yeah. till four in the afternoon or something originally. I am often have to remember, um, we, for some odd reason, Cambridge School of Art, I was taught the history of art by the, um, the teacher of the history of art at Trinity College. I don't know why that happened. So that was, that was useful. And mm -hmm. I wouldn't have known about, um, Eid or his house if it hadn't been for those kind of people teaching and we used to go to his house and Gaudia Bresca's drawings were really a big influence because they were quick um, they had a lot of life they had energy and there were lots of stuff in there that was very filchable if you know what I mean mm, mm. plenty of stuff to lift so I love your terminology you've got filchable you've got being abused and exploited and you got selfish and <laughs> I, they're all completely concise have you um, ever met an artist that wasn't because i haven't now, i've met no, but, ones that are selfish and charming that's not a bad combination but fil there's filtering and there's inspiration you know they're, they're very interesting really interesting lovely i'd love, love to have time uh, to talk to you about it more but there's Filching is, yeah, that's a car dealer's term, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Well, there's plenty of stuff to lift. I mean, you have to change it just a little bit, you know? Well, you do have to change it a little bit. There's a moot point there. But, uh, yeah. I was going to ask you about something about ceramics. I don't really know. How, I mean, you've done frightfully well because it's really quite difficult oh, to make true. any money. 
And not yeah. only that, unless you dedicate yourself to it, anything that can go wrong goes wrong, even when you're working with people that know what they're doing. Yeah. And one of the things that really annoyed me was the very first exhibition I had. Um, I'd, made, I'd made a jumping creature, I can't remember what it was, and some flying snails, which were, I, I took to, the, um, to a foundry. And they sold, and the ceramics that you, maybe you made seven, because I didn't know what I was doing, until you got one that worked. And you couldn't charge half the money for the, <laughs> that you got for the bronze. Now, if you take a piece of work to a foundry, and give it to the chap that knows what he's doing, you'll get a piece of bronze sculpture. That is not true with, um, with ceramics. No. I mean, have you got it down pat? I mean, can you, you know that it'll come out now. No, not at all. I mean, there are so many, you can't take your, you can't take your finger off the boiled clay. Doesn't forgive foolish, foolish things. So there are so many rules and there are so many variables that um, things still go wrong, still, still go wrong. And I still, when I open that kiln door, uh, that big kiln, it might have three months of work in it. Yeah. In work, day and night, I do a double shift. I do 10 till six and then I do eight till two, most days. And uh, the whole kiln can be in there and it takes four days from shutting the door to opening it again, as you know, because of the heating and the cooling. Yeah. And that feeling is just the same feeling that I had at my big, rough, comprehensive school when I had to sort of try and get into the classroom when it wasn't really on my timetable to go and see what had happened in the kiln. It never, ever, that sense of anticipation, the sense of fear, that something's fallen or gone wrong, or that you've done something wrong. Obviously, that increases. The more you know, the more you can go know that can go wrong. When you're young, you don't really know or understand. So ceramics is that constant challenge to understanding. And then once you get on top of it, you want to learn something else, which is more difficult or differently difficult and things like that. So, you know, it's from house bricks to roof tiles to building facades to tiny, tiny, beautiful porcelain yeah. things you know so it'll kind of keep me busy you know till i die probably my husband's probably quite pleased he just does what he likes yeah well <laughs> i do i'm a bit like that way about the ceramics um you remember you were taught by janice at the college weren't you janice oh, yeah. and i met her much later than that and we did some work together janice chilenko uh, Jan janice chilenko sadly and, died a couple of years ago didn't she i know i know that, yes, I miss her a lot. Yeah. I did learn a lot from, from Janice, and I always remember we did some heads, which she um, salt glazed. And uh, I was expecting that they would look like the Martin brothers. And we opened the kiln, and they, all that had happened was they'd gone white. <laughs> they looked like dead bones, in the, and I was so disappointed. Oh. And she said, well, have you looked at them? Yeah, but they're not what we, that's not the point, Roger. Have you looked at them? And a couple of them weren't too bad, even though they were white. And I was moaning about it. We went to have a drink and I was moaning about it. And she said, Roger, when you open the kiln door, that's as exciting as it gets, all right? <laughs> <laughs> and she was right. There was no, there was... <laughs> There was no show that went out to people or, you know, that was it. Yeah. But a lot of fun. It's only when I started taking it a bit more seriously that it became less fun. When you, uh, you've got a dealer now. Yes. I always thought, and I'm, I'm asking you what you think. I always thought that by the time you had an agent, someone volunteered to be your agent, you probably didn't need one. Huh. I think in ceramics, you do need a gallery. Yeah, you do. Because they can charge more than you would ever dare to. Yes, they, they have a voice for you. And they, well, I, my dealer, who I've been with for 23 years, I certainly did need one when he came to me. And I, and I you know, he's symbiotic to, to my development. Money aside, you know, he's always said, 
do what you dream of doing and let me sort it out. Let me try and sell it. Don't, don't copy, you know, don't redo things because you feel you have to move forward. And the best, the best dealer, the best sort of agent for an artist is one who encourages new work and, and excellence. And the, uh, I know Felicity's list here today. Hello, Felicity. But I've watched her blossom under his wing. And, you know, obviously there are other, other parts of, of the artist development. But to have somebody where you know you've got the place where you can show better than you could ever dream of showing and an audience wider than you could ever have dreamt of is very lovely. I mean, I balance that sort of uh, exclusivity and high end. I'm not going to say luxury at all, because these pieces, when you look at pieces throughout history, the finest pieces are the most inspiring. But I do balance that with work for hospitals and schools and libraries and community work. So I feel very strongly about community and being a part of that. And so I, uh, again, with ceramics, you know, the possibilities are endless with making, but also the application is very wide, you know, from architecture through to cutlery and roof tiles. And one of the things about Janice Chelenko, and those of you who are watching really should look her up because she was so inspiring in that she turned from one room of ceramics to another. She worked with fine artists. She she just changed and she wasn't scared of change. In fact, she, she obviously enjoyed it because I think she got bored quite quickly. I don't get bored quite quickly. This pumpkin, I've been making pumpkins amongst other things, but the pumpkin, 20 years of this form, that I can't get enough of for obvious reasons because it's very uh, satisfying to work on. Well, I have to say some lovely comments. Everyone's really enjoyed this and they've said how much they love you two talking together and being in you know in the room with you which is lovely um one question that i wanted to ask and particularly from the friends of kettle's yard i know you both um are very fond i mean kate did make a funny comment before we all started on this but um you know i i wanted to ask you as the friends of kettle's yard what's your favorite piece of artwork from kettle's yard and you know have you visited do you remember it what are your memories of kettle's yard i remember it well as a student i used to go there a lot and I took my own children there because I lived in Cambridge. Um, it's quite a funny story because the BBC said, you've got to pick a thing you like in the Kettle's yard, in, in Jimmy Eads' house, actually. And I worked really hard on it and I recorded it for them. And then the woman said halfway through it, Roger, that's boring. <laughs> and it was a cat trying to get some meat. Um, and, and a jumping, beautiful drawing. And I said, well, he, uh, Gaudi Bresca had such a lot of trouble with the cat that he pinned the meat on a string from the ceiling and the cat had to jump up to eat it, which was all lies. And it went out on BBC Two. And I was waiting for the, you know, the, with the inevitable person to pick me up on it and nobody said a word. <laughs> That's television for you. <laughs> You're so naughty. <laughs> so um, I've got two things I wanted to say is do look out on my Instagram for this charity project to get kids touching and, and experiencing clay kids who really need it and I also want to say I read the kettle I, I went to Kettle's Yard when I was at the Royal College in 1984 and it was the pebbles in the circle it was the pebbles on the table that got bigger and bigger or smaller and smaller it was that, that it was that I'd never seen anything like it in the 80s sort of Andy Goldsworthy kind of thought of, of something found being put together to make something very sensitive and beautiful. Did you but go I home and paint your house white, Kate? What? Because he had white walls before anybody had white walls. He did. And he wrote, and I, re and I read it in the catalogue yesterday, I felt strongly my need to give to others these things which have so much been given to me. Yeah. And I feel the same with my clay. The pleasure of making, I hope, pushes forward in its new life when it's a finished thing and somebody has it or a public art piece. And, and, he's, and he wanted to create a sanctuary for people. And I, I think every university should have a place like that. Uh, it's, it's university. Let's not talk about the demise of universities. But I feel that pottery studios or artist studios or places for thinking 
are those places for sanctuary. We can all do that at home, have a corner or a place or a particular habit which creates that mode, I think. And that's what I wanted. That's what I've taken away from tonight myself from thinking about Kettle's Yard. It's a very beautiful place. Um, well, uh, thank you. I think Roger and Kate, everyone have really enjoyed this. You have been so generous with your time. And, you know, I can't think, you know, a more interesting conversation. So uh, I think we should all say thank you to, to Roger and Kate. And uh, hopefully we'll see you again soon. <laughs>